And we're going to go ahead and get started because we have a lot to talk about today. So again, thank you. And I know that you've had that, that chance to go ahead and fill out that sign-in sheet. So we're going to jump right into it. Introductions are in order. Hello, my name is Mary Lou Strimble. I am a literacy consultant for Wayne Risa. My experience is um, half Half of my experience is at middle school level. Half of my experience is at elementary level. I am a member of the task force for the uh, disciplinary literacy essential document. And um, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, my two colleagues that are here today with me. So, Laura, you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, everybody. I'm Laura Gabrion. I'm a literacy consultant at Wayne Risa. I'm also on the distance. Oh, my goodness. I don't know why I'm getting. There's, of course, a vacuum cleaner in the hallway. So that's really throwing me off. But um, I am part of the disciplinary literacy task force, just like Mary Lou. And we're really always excited when anyone wants to talk about disciplinary literacy with us. And Colleen, do you want to go ahead and, and introduce yourself? Oh, sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Colleen Whalen. I'm one of the literacy consultants along with Mary Lou and Laura. And I see Rosalind's also on board with us today, too. And I see Virginia Winters is also on board with us today. So we've got quite a few Risa folks. I'm just doing the behind the scenes stuff, but I'm also excited to learn um, from Mary Lou and Laura. They have a lot to share about disciplinary literacy. Thank you, Colleen, and thank you for lifting that we have our wonderful colleagues joining us. So hi, Jenny. Hi, Roz. Thanks for joining us. Um, if you just jumped on, there is a QR code there on the screen. We're going to ask that you sign in, and that's also your access for sketches. And we're going to drop a link in the chat for you as well to make your sign in a little easier. So today, in our time today together, our first outcome or our learning target is to introduce and revisit the disciplinary essentials. For some of you, this might be the first time you're seeing the document. For many of you, it might be that you've seen the document, but you need to review it. Recently, this document has been revised through the lens of equity and inclusion. So we also wanna give you a chance to really explore the document through those that lens. And then next, we wanna Define the three dimensions of engagement so we have a common understanding as we go through and align engagement with this document and those instructional practices. So that's our, those are our outcomes for today. Now our working agreements, we have five of them. Laura, you wanna jump in? Sure, we um, would love for you to look through these and to think about one that you're really going to focus in on today. So whether it's demonstrating a mutual respect, my favorite is always engaging in humble inquiry, but any of these five and go ahead and put into the chat the one that you are going to attend to today. I know I'm, I'm always working on employing skillful listening so at this time, once you have your number selected and you've placed it in the chat, what we're gonna ask you to do, take a moment and think about the environment in which you're in and what can you change in that environment to make you more successful with the number that you have chosen. So Vicki has chosen three. So again, Vicki, if there's some, something in your environment that you could change, that will make you more successful in the goal with the number three, we invite you at this time to do that. For instance, I'll turn over my phone because when my phone is on and I can see it, that pulls away my ability to be a skillful listener. And we've got a number five in there, remaining fully engaged, especially after an all day, if we have been um, working at summer school or we're back in the classroom or we're or at home and we have a lot of responsibilities, sometimes it's a, it's a little difficult to stay engaged. So thank you for selecting one of the working agreements and being mindful of that. So with our work today, we talked about in our outcome that we really want to center ourselves in a common definition of what engagement is. And after the past 18 months, we've most likely heard this term engagement 
And we really want to reflect on our current reality within the classroom spaces. But what do we mean when we say engagement? So what I want you to do is just take a moment and think about how you would answer that question. What is engagement to you? You can grab a paper and a pen and, and jot down some notes. You can just do quiet contemplation. But when you think about engagement, how would you answer that question? What is engagement? So just take a quiet minute to think about that answer. We've had a little bit of processing time. I'm going to invite you to record your in a interactive platform. The interactive is Mentimeter. And you'll notice on the screen, there's a QR code, but we're also going to drop a link in the chat. And what we'd like you to do is using your device, if you could please put in the answer to your question. What is engage, or I'm sorry, let me back up a little. What I want you to do is record the, the completion of this statement. Engagement is not. So we're actually going to ask you to flip it. You just wrote about what your definition of engagement is. We'd like you to flip it now. Engagement is not. And we'd like you to record that in your platform, Mentimeter. If you're having a difficult time accessing it, please let us know in the chat and we'll help you out with that. But you can use the QR code or the link, or you can unmute and just ask for help. So take a moment and record your answer to engagement is not. All right, what I love about this platform is it populates immediately. So let's take a look at what we're seeing as our responses. Engagement is not consistently being a sage on the stage. Yes, that teacher control of the learning. Engagement is not always visible. It is not passive learning. Engagement is not staying on the periphery of experience and learning. Engagement is not just listening. Yes, it's interacting, it's participating. Wonderful. All right. So could I get someone to take a little bit of a risk for me? Could you unmute and could you read this quote for me? Without engagement, we've got nothing. Thank you, Ginny, for reading that for us. This quote comes from Jennifer Cerevello, and she is an author. Um, she is the author, actually, of the best-selling New York Times best-selling list, The Reading Strategy Book, and she's a former New York City teacher. And she's also a literacy consultant for Heinemann. She believes that in the absence of engagement, learning does not progress. So thinking about engagement, we're gonna lean into Fredericks and Blumfields and other colleagues work around the three dimensions of engagement. And recently I had the pleasure of diving into Fisher, Fry and Hattie who took this work and kind of pushed it past just these three dimensions and thinking about it as far as moving our kids from compliance to engagement. Compliance is the idea that students simply do the business of school, right? They do the problems on the worksheet. They come to, if it's a virtual space, they come and they turn on their camera. They show up, they do the assignment, they take the assessment. In order to move from the stagnant state, state of just compliance into engagement, we really need to consider that there's three dimensions of engagement. The first dimension of engagement is what people usually raise when they say, my kids aren't engaged in the virtual space. And that's really about the level of participation in class or in that virtual space. And that's the how to do school, the, the camera's on, they hand in their assignment, their time on task, they complete their homework. That's behavioral engagement. And you can have students that are in compliance and have behavioral engagement. But we need to consider the other two domains, and that's cognitive engagement and emotional. Now, when we speak about cognitive engagement, we're talking about the psychological efforts that students put forth. So it really involves how the brain works and the actions that are taken. 
things like reasoning and planning and asking and answering questions, their ability to say, this is my answer, here is my reasoning, here is the evidence to support it. And they're also able to monitor their own progress. They're problem solvers, they're seeking challenges. When students are using that type of mindset, they are cognitively engaged. But another domain that we need to really think about is emotional, because without the emotional, cognitive doesn't happen and behavioral doesn't happen. Emotional is based on students' feelings. It's the safety in order to engage. So if they are feeling safe, or if they're feeling interested and valued, it's based on the relationships they have with their teacher and their peers, then students are able to then engage cognitively and behaviorally. And it's really that feeling of, I matter in this space. And when they feel that, they will enter into discussions. They will pose questions. They look at mistakes as opportunities for learning, not something that they're going to close down on. It really is, it supports their self-efficacy. We need to consider how we include students' identities and their interests to really raise their motivation so they are emotionally engaged. So we want you to just stop and think for a second. How are we allowing students to interact as they build their skills and develop their intellect? How are we allowing time for them to express their identity? We want to move our students into making an emotional commitment to their learning goals. We want to be removed from being the sage on the stage. We want them to self-monitor and to really take risks. So we need to address all three dimensions when we're thinking about planning our lessons and interacting with students. We want to make sure that we are addressing all of the three dimensions of engagement. So in just a minute, we're going to put into the chat the link to the essential practices for disciplinary literacy. And these are geared towards the secondary classroom, grades 6 to 12. But before you open those up, what I want you to just note is some structural aspects of the document itself. It begins with a purpose, and that purpose is overarching for the set of 10 practices. And then the first thing that you're going to see is a general set of 10 essential practices. All of the, the 10 practices, whether they're the general ones, ELA, math, science, or social studies are exactly the same essential practices, but the general ones can be applied to any discipline. What you'll notice in ELA, in math, social studies, and science is that those bullet points that break down that essential practice are very specific to the, um, the discipline itself. So in ELA, maybe something like um, understanding text features and, and what types of text we would read will be spelled out uh, differently than it would be in math. So just wanted to give you a little bit of that as you got ready to um, you know, engage with this text. We're gonna give you five minutes. That's not enough time, we know that, to look through the 10 essential practices, but choose whether you want the um, general ones or you want to look at one of the discipline specific ones and just take some time to read through. So at this time, we know that five minutes was not enough time, but hopefully you were able to skim through the document. And um, we'd like to kind of now align the, um, the idea of the three dimensions of engagements with the document. So what we'd like you to do is to consider those three dimensions of engagement as we make space for you to further explore the document. So using the inquiry questions that you see on the screen and that can be found in your breakout resource sheet, which we dropped in the chat, but we're gonna put back in there again. What we're gonna do is just ask you to, to stop and think about one of the essentials. We're gonna start with the general essential one. And we're gonna ask you to really think about the three dimensions. So 
in an emotional engagement, as you are in a moment going to be given a space to really look at essential number one, we want you thinking about these questions. So the emotional engagement, how might we cultivate students' interest and build relationships to help students feel valued? So as you go through essential number one, thinking about that, how does this instructional practice support that emotional engagement? For cultiv- our cognitive engagement, how are we really pushing our students to think critically, to be able to feel safe enough to take the risk to answer questions, to make mistakes, to really look for evidence to support. So how can we develop students' sense of competency and autonomy during their own learning? And then finally, that behavioral engagement. How do we define and measure meaningful participation? We want to pull away from compliance. We want to make sure that students are learning. And how do we know that they are learning? So what we'd like to do And um, we were initially going to put you into breakout rooms, but since it's such a small group, we'll we'll stay in this main room. And we're going to go ahead and we just dropped into the chat a link to um, the essential number one only. It's a PDF. So we've isolated that out for you. And we're going to give you some time just to look over essential one. Think about those three questions, which you can find on your resource page, those three driving questions for the engagement. And then we really want you to start pulling some information. How does this instructional practice support the three dimensions of engagement? Now, um, we're going to, when we come back together, we're going to ask someone to be the messenger. Okay. And the messenger's job is to share out one thing that resonates with them. So if you're willing to be the messenger, could you please let us know in the chat? Just go ahead and say, I'll do it. Just type it in the chat for us. So we know there'll be someone who will be responsible for that. So go ahead and just respond. I'll be the messenger in the chat. Thank you, Vicki, we appreciate you. So at this time, what we'd like to do is give you five minutes. And the first two minutes are just really going to be looking at essential one and pondering those driving questions. Then we'll come back and um, at the, after the two minute mark, we'll ask you to respond. How does essential one support the three dimensions of engagements of engagement? What questions might you have about this procedure? Go ahead and unmute and ask. What questions might you have? Okay, I'm gonna set my timer for two minutes. At the end of the two minutes, we're gonna go ahead and have a conversation. Okay, find a comfortable stopping point. Your processing of essential one. Now, Vicki, I'm going to call out to you after we're done sharing as the messenger, you're going to kind of synthesize or lift any big ideas that resonated with the group. And I'm going to play the position of conversation starter. All right. So I'm going to call out. um, Let's see. Um, I'm, I'm going to invite Rebecca. I'm going to invite you to go ahead and answer this question or um, add anything else you want besides an answer to this question. What are you thinking about as far as this essential one and its support of the three dimensions? Can you go ahead and unmute and share? Well, I have to say, I'm sorry because I missed the first part of the of the uh, presentation. Um, and I was trying, I hope I was reading the right thing when you told me to. So I'm trying to like kind of figure this out as we go. Um, but are we reading what said was called problem one? Is that what we were supposed to be reading? Yes. Okay. I'm just making sure because um, I, I apologize. I was coming in kind of late. Um, well, what I was noticing was that I know lately in a lot of these um, conferences that we've been having, there's this issue of giving choice and offer and lending voice, and letting the student pick and letting the student offer their voice. And so I thought the things that 
kind of struck me as I was reading this was to help establish the purpose. Why, why are we doing this? What is it, you know, and help them to make connections in their own life. And that kind of makes it their own and kind of gives them ownership of what we're looking at or what is being taught. I'm not sure if that answers your question, but that's what struck me as I was reading that. Thanks, Rebecca. I appreciate mm -hmm. the risk and, and sharing your insight and your thinking on that. And we're so glad you're here. So thank you for that. I'm just going to open up the mic and now anybody go ahead and jump in and share. We'd love to hear your thinking. I'd like to share. Absolutely. So yesterday I, I was fortunate to attend a, a workshop on the adolescent brain. And I learned that the adolescent brain begins to prune and there's a, another process of myelination where it allows that, that student to number one, create deeper connections and meanings. And I'm really glad to, to be able to share, to learn in this workshop because with the problem, uh, with number one, as I look at what are the, some of the moves that the teacher does um, in terms of part, the general participation, behavioral, cognitive, and psychological, if we um, engage the student in questions, there's a couple of them there, allow for collaboration, um, allow them to deal with issues that are close to their lives, we're actually strengthening that child's uh, cognitive processes. And I, can't, I cannot help believe that when we do that, uh, we are actually drawing them in to immerse themselves willfully into their learning. And for me, that's, that's the, a, really, a real high point of engagement is it, it, it ups the quotient of investment in the learning while simultaneously developing their um, cognitive capacity as well as, and, he, and I'll go from an equity standpoint, one of the ways in which we do that is to engage them in thinking about some of the issues that are happening in their, in their world contextually. And so, you know, when we help have kids have courageous conversations in the classroom around the things they're trying to make sense of that are happening in the world, we're engaging them on all throttles. And, and I'm so glad to learn now more about this disciplinary literacy and the uh, standards of practice. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I love that you added that, Ginny, though, because they really need to, we were just talking about this in a session that Sharon and I were doing, but, um, and I know that Dr. Shahid is here, and we always talk about reading the world, but connecting that content area with the world, you know, so she showed an image that of course makes me queasy. It was someone jumping from one end of a mountain to another. And there's of course a big dip in the middle, but you have to know some math to know you're going to make that leap successfully to the other side of this big, you know, kind of, uh, I don't know what about ravine, but um, anyway, yeah, it's just, it's, it's engaging them and things that they're thinking about and things that they're worrying about or, or have questions about. And um, I think it's, it's a great place to start because we want them to be able to extend that to the world around them. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. I can just add to, I think um, first and foremost, the document uh, I appreciate the revisions and the centering of equity in the document. Uh, but one of the things that the whole, just the first phrase, right, problem-based, whenever we can provide a space for students to be the generators of, to use their, you know, use their minds and to frame, frame our discussions as a question as opposed to, um, this kind of regurgitation, I think it supports the all three really emotional engagement, cognitive engagement, and behavioral engagement. And in addition to that piece, I think, you know, aside from the document, like really providing the space, you said, Laura, that you're, you're going to look at that humble inquiry, like really thinking about like these three dimensions. So as opposed to us kind of thinking is uh, our students engaged based on how they appear. I was the one that says, you know, sometimes engagement, it may not be visible, but that student could be, you know, really, really engaged. So thinking about it through this lens, 
actually supports um, all, the entire document along with any, you know, any kind of teaching that we're doing. Mm -hmm. It really leans into, we value our, our students. We value their thoughts. We value their insights by allowing them to engage in inquiry instead of telling them, this is what we're going to do and this is how we're going to do it. Mm -hmm. By allowing them a safe space, a courageous space for that to happen, we're building their intellect, we're building their criticality. So thank you for engaging in that conversation around Essential One and the powerful debrief. You know, and I, I'm practicing listening skills, but all is resonating with me is how valuable it is to let your staff engage in inquiry too and, and wonder and discussion and give us a question to solve. We really do have the students' best intentions in mind and I don't think it's ever tapped. I think a lot of, it may not be true at every school and I'm, I'm not trying to put my school down, but I would love to hear other teachers input more and give input and collaborate more than we do. And I think there's so much that there is to offer from the teacher standpoint with the students that it's, it's overlooked that administrative do this without asking us, what do you think we should do? It's, it's just under, under utilizing our resources of, of love and care that we actually have for our kids. <laughs> Vicki, that's such a powerful observation because a lot of times what we try to, it, there's a, a really good book called Investigating Disciplinary Literacy, but it it really sets up almost like a parallel journey, right? Because you're, you're absolutely right. As teachers, we're always on an inquiry cycle. We're trying to figure out what we're doing. We're constantly fine tuning our craft so that we're better at what we do. And we're bringing in research in all different kinds of ways, kids' facial expressions, the way that they they write something and we're like, oh, they didn't get it. I, I realize right now I missed the mark. And so we're constantly pulling in data and we're using that data to make some changes. And that's inquiry, right? So often our students might be investigating something totally different, but that's an investigation nonetheless. And I think that's that's the richest opportunity when we're on a parallel journey with them, maybe we're doing something slightly different, but we're like, yeah, you know what? I could not find any articles that supported my, my journey either. So let's get back at the drawing board. Maybe we're not looking with the right keywords or, or whatever it is, but because we're on a path, we know the, the obstacles that we're encountering, they're gonna encounter some of the same ones that offers us an opportunity to teach in a way that um, relates directly to them. The power of inquiry. So I, Vicki, as you were talking about um, the, the opportunity for staff and inquiry, I just think to myself, how might we use these instructional practices with a staff under the guise of inquiry to then lift that up? That if, if we can use this document as a way of um, maybe in PLCs or in our professional learning to say, you know what, the document says we should take an inquiry stance. Let's try it ourselves. So thank you for lifting that. That really got us. Thinking about it. We just had like a, a three day and Rebecca was in one of my groups. <laughs> we felt like the breakfast club when we finished. <laughs> we all said we're going to watch the breakfast club because I mean, we were on, we were actually almost smacking each other down by the end, like, but being real with each other and like, just really, yeah, you hit it on the head and you don't know when it says that, but that's what, that's real. And we were really, really getting to the core of some things we think are the problem. And if we all did that, maybe, maybe we'd work out more stuff instead of just, I don't know. I think relinquishing power as a teacher is really hard. I think it's probably really hard at the administrative level. But if we could, our interest is, we are intrinsically motivated to help these kids. So it shouldn't be a fear. It's just, I don't know what it is. I, I got know, a lot I, out of our three. Vicki, I so agree with you. And I think part of it is that the structure that we, within which we work, we're going to have to break out of the structure some, in some way. Um, our structure doesn't lend itself to that kind of inquiry in the, in our, as professionals. So the, the decision to break out of the structure 
has to be extremely intentional and strategic. And it's got to be delivered. And I think that if you start small, start with small times doing it, it can begin to grow because I really, at my heart of hearts, I must honor that teachers are inquirers. They do it every day, but our structure crowds us out sometimes. And, and I think that once you spark that in a teacher, it comes, it goes full for it, it comes full bloom. So I would encourage you, you know, just as you as you're saying, how important that is, because without authentic conversation and inquiry in our schools, we are not going to improve. That is an equity issue. So I'm gonna get off my soapbox. You guys got me all charged up and I need to be quiet. We value your voice, Jenny, so please speak up anytime you'd like. Yeah, and I'm, I'm going to bring it back to the three dimensions again. Um, Vicki, when you were talking about working in that group and you were real with each other, were you in, a, in an environment in that group, that small group, where you felt safe enough to do that? If, if those conversations were happening, I'm going to lean into, yeah, you, you probably felt safe in that group. So again, it goes back to that community and building that opportunity for engagement. So. Yeah. Oh, you're muted. We could not have said the things we said if we didn't have good rapport with each other. We, we have great rapport and respect each other. And it, it turned out that we could say more than we normally would in a staff meeting where it's never welcome. Like, mm -hmm. let's get out as soon as possible feeling. Yeah. So you, in your way, just like Jenny was talking about, you pushed against the system. You wouldn't normally have done that, but you were in an, in an environment where you felt safe, that emotional engagement took place. So that cognitive and behavioral engagement was also met. So thank you for sharing that. Thank you, Jenny, for um, adding your voice to that. And I'm gonna turn it over to Laura. I almost wish I could switch the two slides, um, the order of them, because what we've been talking about kind of paves the way for um, the next slide. Um, but I just, you know, in thinking about um, just obviously we are passionate people. You can tell by the conversations that we're having. We feel strongly about the way we teach, the topic that we teach. And that, that um, slide about building curiosity was really thinking about, and this is something that I forget sometimes, especially when I was trudging in day after day to the classroom. And, you know, I, I, migrated to teaching English at the secondary level because I really love literature. I love reading. I love writing. I love words. And so sometimes though, when you're in the throes of it, you lose track. Why did I even come here? What am I here for? You know? And so sometimes we have to build that curiosity by showing our passion, um, getting them to think aloud right beside us so that we model our curiosity. Maybe we gamify it. Maybe we create those opportunities for inquiry. And I was thinking about what, um, when we were, were talking about inquiry, when we give them the opportunity to really ask some deep questions, we know this can sometimes get carried away. There's kids who can read the us and read the room. And they're thinking, I don't wanna do whatever she has planned for today. So I'm gonna ask a whole bunch of questions get her way off track, and we're never going to get to the homework we need to do or the assignment we need to do. So you, you can pick up those kinds of things and know that you've got to rein it in a little bit. But I remember classrooms where I was so riveted on getting through the, that lesson for that day, and someone would ask an amazing question, and I'd think, uh-huh, you know, I'd answer it as fast as I could, just now turn the page, now look up at the board. Now write your response because I was nervous about pacing and I was nervous about a test that they were going to come up against or whatever it was. And I think that we miss the mark. We forget to build that curiosity and to let that curiosity grow. And that comes back to poor Mary Lou. She's doing the slides and I'm like, go to 13, no, 14, 13. Um, but we are now where we're thinking about that classroom atmosphere, just exactly what you guys were talking about. We have... Um, just this year published the school-wide practices for secondary for disciplinary literacy. So that document, I'm gonna put it in the chat in just a second, but um, what, it, what it really talks about is the atmosphere, the climate and culture 
in um, Farrington's white paper talks about the same kind of thing. We want a classroom where kids can say, I belong. I feel like I can be successful here. I will get better with effort. My work has value, but we know they don't just move from room to room in our high schools and middle schools feeling this way. We have to build it. We have to build it in our rooms, but we have to build it across buildings. And that's when we see them engaged because they feel like engagement is a risk worth taking. So thinking about that, I had, I had the pleasure of being in a space with one of my um, math consultant colleagues. And she was talking about Dr. Barry, who is a former NCT president. Um, and he shared these rights of the learner. And these were explicitly stated and um, explained to the students within these math classrooms. The first one is, you have the right to be confused. Okay, I am not a math person. So I wish someone would have said that to me in my, in my um, educational career. But really, if you think about across the content, many times students feel almost a fear to be confused. So thinking about that emotional engagement and allowing kids to know that mistakes are not something that are bad. Confusion is not something that's bad. It's something that's really productive. And it's looked on in this classroom as an asset. You have the right to claim a mistake. So when you say a mis when you make a mistake, you, you stand tall and proud and say, this is why I got here. Because you are in an environment where the rest of the people in your classroom will say, you know what, that happened to me. Or I can see where you're coming from, and this is why. You have the right to speak, listen, and be heard. So Laura was talking about that, that ultimate rush or that stage on the stage where the teacher is like, I've got to get through this. But really slowing it down and going deeper and knowing, being um, a learner in a classroom where I know when I raise a question that's valid, that's on topic, that they're going to honor that. And if we don't have space right that minute to answer that question, I can trust that the instructor, the teacher, or other students will help me bring it back. And then finally, I have the right to write or, or represent or present my thinking in any mode that is comfortable for me. I am comfortable with that. I'm given a safe space, a courageous space for that to happen. So I just love the idea of the rights of learners, putting it out there, maybe co-creating this with your students, but making it available and explicitly taught and revisited. The revisited part is very important because otherwise it becomes white noise in our classrooms. So at this point, um, we'd like to give you a little bit of an um, opportunity to view what this looks like and sounds like in a classroom. So we'd like you to watch this video. It's a ninth grade English classroom, and they are doing a lesson on one of Poe's short stories. And what we'd like you to do, again, thinking about those three dimensions of engagement, we'd like you to notice what the teacher's doing how she's addressing the dimensions instructionally in her curriculum design, and then how are the students responding? Okay, here we go. Funding for this program is provided by Annenberg Learner. If I asked you to write me a paragraph about Montresor and prove all those things, what else could you prove about him besides that he wants revenge? What can you say about Montresor that you could prove, that you could show me evidence in the text to prove it? Tara, you have something? Um, he's completely xenophobic of people from certain countries because he talks about Fortunato as being a quack, like people from that certain country. Okay. And you could find a quote to prove that? Yeah. Okay. Daniel, what do you got? Um, he's rich because he likes to buy um, expensive wines. And you could prove that. Yeah, because in the story it says he likes to buy expensive wines. We want to now take this to another level. Compare Montresor with Fortunato. Today was their first real exposure to the kinds of comparative language that they'd be using. Building toward a larger uh, end unit goal where they will compare the techniques Poe uses in Casco Amontillado to 
the techniques that uh, Charles Lawton uses in Night of the Hunter, which is a 1955 film noir. I need you to open the T-chart example that's listed for you on the blog. And when you open it, it's going to look like this, comparing Montresor and Fortunato. I'm asking you to tell me some things that they have in common, some similarities, and some things that they have different. Don't worry about the right side yet. Take about one minute, and I really am only giving you one minute, to write down one or two things they have in common and one or two things they are different about. Go. Eventually, they need to be able to write about this text at a very deep level. So all of this is all still sort of about getting them to know Casco Amontillado better. So what did you say were some things they had in common? They both like wine. rich. Because they can buy the wine. Because I bet they buy like pretty expensive good wine. OK, so they're wealthy people, right? Um, what would you say were some of their differences? There's a really stark difference, people. Montresor wants to kill um, Fortunato. <laughs> yeah, one of them's a murderer, right? Do you see what's coming here? Yeah, yeah. yeah you want us to find evidence. Okay, so to the right, you need your evidence. In the form of what? Quotes. Yeah, you're going to need quotes from the story. Find some evidence that proves the things you said they were similar or different about. Whether your similarities and differences are the same as what we have on the board or not, you need to be able to back it up. What in the story do you find that backs up what you said on the left side? I was asking for them to compare the two characters, and then a column next to that that they're fairly familiar with now that asks them to present evidence for their thinking about those two characters. Tell me what you're looking for. Evidence. What does that mean to you? Quotes, right? So does a quote have to be like the character actually talking, or what kind of quotes no, are you talking about? No, it's just um, pieces of the that proves what I'm looking for. Okay, can you do that? Okay. You definitely get more out of books after being in this class because after having to analyze books and really get into the deeper meaning of the book, I start doing that with every book, which is something I didn't used to do. So that's really good. You have the high level thinking about this story, but I need you to back up what you're thinking with evidence from the text. Okay. okay. Share what you got. Share the wealth. Every time they have an opportunity to be exposed to what's happening in that text, I'm giving them another chance at that. I used, we came at length to the foot of the descent and stood together upon the damp ground of the catacombs, which are a place like down, of the Montressors. I got the skillful Italian vintages myself and bought largely whenever I could for a Fortunato's, like, better winemaker than Montressor. And then for a difference, I put, I continued as I was into my smile in his face, and he did not perceive that my two smile now was at the thought of his emulation. Okay. I didn't, was that for the similarities? Yeah, for the differences. Okay. For this next part, on top of your T-chart, which is in your writer's notebook, I would like you to write for me a paragraph comparing Montresor and Fortunato using the evidence you've already found. Now, I have a couple things to help you with this. You can just write this paragraph. Some of you are totally capable of just writing this paragraph. Some of you may want to refer to the words for writing about compare contrast, phrases you can use when things are the same, phrases you can use when things are different. If you would like more support for writing your paragraph, on your table is a paragraph frame for comparison. Okay, So you can use that. On the back of that is even more words for using comparison. Okay. So what So thinking around this idea of the three dimensions and that essential number one, um, can you unmute and share what's something that you noticed from this video that the teacher, either the teacher's instructional moves or curriculum design and or the students move that really lean into those three dimensions or that essential one that we looked at? Go ahead and unmute and share. And we're getting down to the last, the last bit of our time together. So I think everybody's kind of tired out. So we're going to go ahead and give you a, a pass on this one. Really, we're looking at the structure of her, of her lesson. She um, allowed them to um, have conversations. They are, you witnessed some small group in, instruction there or time for them to share their ideas. She also went el elbow to elbow with 
a couple of her students to make sure that they understood what was going on. And thinking about that when you're thinking about those emotional engagement, she's making them feel as if they can do it. And she's checking in with them and, and monitoring their progress. So of course we had more in place, but we're running out of time. So we're gonna speed this up really quickly and let you know that recently in a blog that I was um, fortunate to co-author with two of my ISD RISA colleagues, Victoria Less from St. Clair County and Liz Leitz from Macomb ISD, we um, created a blog for the uh, Disciplinary Literacy Essential site. And we did this work with Essential 8 for ELA. We dove into Essential 8, um, bullet one, which really um, focuses on observing students, um, their, their um, capability of, of their learning, and then uh, the assessment piece. And we really dove into to bullet one, and we were pleasantly surprised that, yes, there were opportunities for each dimension of engagement in just the first bullet of Essential Eight. So our plan in the future is to really dive into each one of the essentials, each one of the bullets, and really kind of lift these pieces of engagements that these instructional practices support. Um, I see that Laura has dropped the our uh, actual blog post in there. So we invite you to visit that if you have it, um, some time and you would like to read a little bit more about our process, we invite you to do that. And then to, to streamline us, what we'd like you to do just to finish out with today is, we just wanna see how do you now define engagement? Has there been some change in your thinking? Are some things pulled from our, our hour together? And what I'd like you to do again is to access our um, Mentimeter. If you answered the first time, um, you'll see the second question pop up when you go ahead and log in again. Use the QR code and we're gonna drop the link in for you as well. And then we'll just, this'll be how we're gonna close out our time together. So how do you define engagement? And as we wait for these to, to um, populate, we're gonna drop that sign-in sheet one more time into the chat because we wanna make sure everybody had an opportunity to sign in so they're eligible for the sketches. And Laura and I would like to say thank you so much for your time. Thank you, um, Colleen, for your support on your back channel. Thank you, Dr. Shahid and uh, Jenny Winters for joining us today in our session. Yes, thanks all of you. I know three to four in the last waning days of summer might not be a place that you want to be, but we're really glad you were here with us. So we're at that four o'clock mark. So we understand that some of you might be able to, might have to step out at this time. So thanks again for joining us. Thank you for your insight in your conversation and have a wonderful evening.